So now I would love to welcome Chris Peterson to the show to talk about the two funds for life method. Chris, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. So Chris is the director of research at the Merriman Financial Education Foundation. That's a mouthful. Did I get that right? Yeah, you got it right. Perfect. And when I talked to Paul on the phone a couple weeks ago about this episode, he told me and he repeated this many times that Chris really deserves all the credit for the two funds for life portfolio. <laughs> so Chris, I want to start with a question that you have probably heard before. Um, target date funds tend to get a bad wrap. For whatever reason, people love to dunk on target date funds. Can you walk our listeners through some of these popular criticisms or maybe the most popular criticism and then how you would respond to those criticisms? Sure. I, you know, and maybe it's the circle I travel in, but a lot of the people that I talk to aren't really that critical about target date funds. Most people, I think, really like them, especially for the bulk of investors. The two things, though, that come to mind in terms of popular criticisms are first that they they tend to be a little bit on the conservative side. So uh, they hold bonds in the early years, which, you know, most young investors really don't need to hold bonds in the early years. They only hold about 10 percent on average. So it's not not much. But um, but really, in an ideal world, I wouldn't have any bonds in there in the early years for an investor. And then in the later years, they they can hold 70 percent in bonds in retirement, which, again, is pretty conservative. I think a lot of investors would do better with a little bit more aggressive portfolio in retirement. So that's the first criticism. And then the second criticism is that they're they're one size fits all. You know, they're basically an off the rack suit. Now, the truth is. Most of us look better in an off the rack suit than nothing at all or left to making our own clothes, right? So uh, that criticism is one that doesn't bother me too much. And there are custom solutions out there, but they tend to be really expensive. So so those are the two criticisms and and the two fun for life strategies that I, that I created working with Paul help address both of those. There are ways that there are basically ways that a DIY investor with just a few really simple things can overcome the over conservatism and can also tune it to to meet their needs. Well I would love to talk about some of those ways if you don't mind. Um no, not most, at all. yeah especially with the over conservatism because I think that would be particularly the 70% bond exposure in retirement. I just was looking into a pretty deep dive into the 4% rule analysis last week and saw that I think the original analysis said if you dip below 50% stocks, things can start to break. So I'm curious how you would advise somebody to tweak around potentially the the conservative nature of, of a target date fund. Yeah, let's, let's definitely go there. But um, just just before we do, I want to point out that there have been studies done that say that the expected return for most investors invested in a target date fund is about 2% higher than they would have done left to their own devices. And and that just goes to show that young investors, old investors, were, were not particularly expert at doing this, especially when you look at the market at large. So uh, I really don't have anything against the average investor investing entirely in a target date fund. In fact, across a lifetime, it'll roughly double the amount of spending power that somebody would have compared to just holding cash in the bank. So a target date fund, it, it just on its own is a great thing. But if you are willing to take the time to, to learn a little bit about investing and you want to do a little bit better, the best diversifying asset class for a target date fund, the thing that's the most different and is going to give you the greatest potential additional return is small cap value. So if you, as a young investor, instead of taking 10 cents out of every dollar and put it in the target date fund, took 9 cents, put it in the target date fund, and one penny and put it in small cap value and just did that for your whole life, never rebalanced or anything, it would give you at least an extra um, 
it's like uh, 20, 30, 30% to spend in retirement and pass on to heirs. It's a huge bump for just this itty bitty tiny move. Um, so I think small cap value is a great tool for investors to, to use to overcome this conservatism in the early years and then carry some of that allocation into retirement because that's going to give you more money to spend in retirement, more money to pass on to heirs and greater resilience against uh, sequence risk. You know, you're going to actually, if you carry 20% into retirement, you can raise your safe withdrawal rate substantially by between a half a percent and 1%. I heard that in a recent Bill Bangin interview where he said he re basically recreated the analysis with small cap value built in and it mm -hmm. it looked a lot more optimistic and i think it's it's an interesting time to be having this conversation i guess really any time in the last decade would have been interesting time to talk about small cap value because it it's certainly a harder sell now but i think i've read y'all's work and i think i buy into the underlying philosophy behind it as a long-term uh outperformer so I, I like that you highlighted that. Um, what was the what was the impetus for developing the two funds for life portfolio, and how would you say it compares to some of the other financial models, if you will, that y'all have worked on? Like, what makes this one special? Well, the the real driver was. Um, a combination of conversations I'd had with Paul about trying to come up with things simple enough that people would actually follow them. And then he had a conversation with Jack Bogle. Um, I remember Jack was getting older and Paul said he had this open invitation to meet with him. And, and I said, you should take that dude. <laughs> I mean, this is a time limited opportunity. And fortunately he met with Jack before uh, Jack passed away. And Jack kind of wagged his finger at Paul and said, you can't expect people to invest in 10 funds and rebalance every year. They just won't do that. And so those those two things led us to try and figure out, well, what are, what are some ways that we could do something simple enough that everybody could follow it? And the fascinating thing for me as we did all the research is that we found out with only two funds you could do as well as you could do with a 10 fund solution rebalance every rebalancing every year managing your own glide path um, doing all of that work and so there's no there's no real reason to have all of the added complexity um, there are a couple of like niggles, right? So if, if you have a 10 fund solution, you have more, more controls. Um, Paul has something called the ultimate buy and hold, and it gives you half in value, half in growth, half in large, half in small, half in US, half in international. And if you want to tweak each and every one of those variables, so you want to be 47% in US and 53% international, you can do that. When you simplify it down to just a couple of funds, you lose some of those controls. So that's one trade-off. The other trade-off is that you lose some ability to position the, the asset classes in their ideal account locations. So idea, in an ideal world, you'd really carry all of your bonds in a tax-deferred account, and you'd have all of your stocks in a taxable account, and um, or, or at least you would have some in each probably. And you don't have as much control over that. Now for somebody who's got all of their savings in an IRA or all of their savings in a 401k, uh, and they don't really care about wanting to touch all of the dials, it's not a big deal. Um, but there are some trade-offs, yeah. Yeah, there was another, I don't know if you recall, a couple months ago when I wanna say Vanguard did some massive rebalancing inside of one of their target date funds and people that held it in their taxable accounts experienced like a pretty substantial taxable event as a result of that and it was kind of a kerfuffle in the news about like whether or not vanguard should have warned people that that was happening or gone about it differently but even the even the asset location argument i find to be so minor compared to you know if if the alternative is like not investing at all or the alternative is having to rebalance 10 funds every year it's like i think i'll i i wouldn't mind you know a little bit more tax liability on the bond interest if um if it means that i'm gonna get such an easy kind of out of the box solution 
Yeah, you know, part of that story with Vanguard is that I, I think some of what they were trying to change helped enable the cost reduction they did too. So the expense ratios on their target date funds funds went from about uh, 0.12 percent per year down to 0.08 percent. So they got way cheaper as a result of some of those changes. But yeah, it was a surprise for people who held target date funds in a taxable account. You know, there's a a behavioral thing that I really like about the simplicity that comes along too. And that's that if you have to rebalance your account every year and, and you've got 10 funds, it gives you all of these chances to look at it and freak out and go, wait a minute, you're making me sell the thing that's doing really well. I don't want to do that. Right. I want to keep like going for the ride where if you only have two funds and you don't have to rebalance during accumulation and then when you get to retirement, you're just taking your what I encourage people to use nudge withdrawals, where you just take the total withdrawal from whichever one's too big or, you know, it's bigger than it's supposed to be. So that's pretty easy, right? You go in and you go, wow, the small cap value thing's been rocking it. I'll just take my 4% out of small cap value. And then you go in the next year and you go, oh, well, you know, I mean, target date funds a little bigger. I'll take my 4% out of that it's a lot easier behaviorally. I think there's a lot fewer chances to kind of second guess things and freak out. Yeah. That's really interesting. And so speaking of the accumulation phase, um, I and the majority of my audience are still in that wealth accumulation phase and a fair distance from traditional retirement. And Lucky so you. <laughs> I know, right? What a great time to be buying. Um, yeah. But I, uh, so in, in the episode, in this episode, I wanted to highlight that 90%, to your point, 90% target date fund, 10% small cap value breakdown. Um, but in, in studying some of your work, I've seen some of these age multipliers and things that could potentially shift uh, what you're choosing. So would you walk us through how you'd recommend people adjust based on their age, if at all? Sure. So if... The reason I created the 9010 one was I wanted something that was easy to communicate, easy to understand, and easy to implement. If you have to go to a second account to get small cap value, uh, it's going to be tough to rebalance between the two locations. And so that's really easy. I think it's relatively easy for people to do then. They can just invest a certain amount in a different account in small cap value and never rebalance. And then in retirement, take the withdrawals where it makes sense. Uh, but what that does is it, it increases the risk in the early years a little bit, but not maybe as much as somebody would have an appetite for. And so in the book, I also outline an approach that starts with about 60 or 70 percent uh, allocated to small cap value in the early years and ramps down to zero around retirement that I call the moderate approach. And then the other one starts out with 100 percent in small cap value in the early years and ramps down to a 20 percent allocation in retirement. And I I did that when I first wrote it down, I said to be kind of wild and crazy aggressive. But when you actually look at how it plays out, um, there's not much more risk in the second one. Um, and the reason there's two reasons for it. Number one, that hundred percent allocation in the early years, you don't have a lot of money. At least most of us didn't, right? I mean, most of us in those early years, it's just not a lot of money. And so when you look at the dollar weighted percent, it's not that big. And then the 20% allocation in retirement, which sounds kind of crazy, right? It's like, wow, that's a lot in small cap value. It turns out uh, because it's so different from what you have in the target date fund, it provides this really meaningful diversification. And, you know, the, the small cap value just zigs and zags at different times from the very conservative target date fund. And it, it boosts your, uh, your safe withdrawal rate, which is something most retirees really care a lot about. That's actually a risk reducer. Um, and the amount that it increases the the kind of the volatility, the ups and downs or the drawdowns you'd have to tolerate isn't that great. And it leaves you with more money and lets you spend more money. So, I mean, it's it, I think it's worth it. It's I mean, all of these things, whenever you take more risk, you have to earn it with better behavior. So that's that's one of the things that anybody thinking about these two fund for life strategies should consider is that you're going to have to have good behavior to get the benefit. If you freak out because you've been holding small cap value for five years and it's unperformed, underperformed the S&P 500 and you sell it, you're not going to get any of the benefit. 
it's funny you say that. I feel like the the buy part is easy. The hold part is not. And so that's right. We have to consistently reinforce that. I'm glad you said that. And I know that you have done some modeling to show how the 4% rule comes into play with the historical outcomes of these portfolios you just mentioned. And I'd never considered that, that small cap value could actually be a de-risker in retirement mm -hmm. because it is uncorrelated or relatively uncorrelated to what the target date fund is doing in retirement. But how did this strategy fare over time with different withdrawal rates in retirement? Well, if you if you look at a target date fund on its own, uh, and you and if I'm really conservative and go back to 1928, it generates about a 3.6, 3.7% 3 safe withdrawal rate over a 30 year retirement, which is pretty good, you know, considering how conservative it is, and it's only making you tolerate maybe a 20% worst case drawdown in retirement. That's that's pretty good. It's not four, but but for most people. 30 years is a relatively long retirement. Adding the small cap value at a 10% level uh, keeps the risk at about the same and the, and the uh, safe withdrawal rate at about the same. When you add 20%, though, uh, in retirement, it bumps up the safe withdrawal rate to over 4% for 30 years, and it gets very close to 4% for a 40-year retiree. So... Um, it if there's a whole bunch of uh, detail and data in the book, and um, if if people want to go through, uh, you know, a lot of the nitty gritty. That's why I wrote the book. Is that I think across a lifetime of investing in any of these approaches, you're going to have a thousand questions that come up, and it takes a book to answer most of them. Yeah, yeah. and so the book is called Two Funds for Life, right? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So everyone, you know where to go get that. Um, I guess, so on that note though, bumping up small cap value exposure to 20%, is that to say that somebody, so I'm 27, is that to say that if I went in and, and basically found the target date fund that aligned to my timeline and put 80% into that and then 20% into small cap value, you're, you're saying that that would be the allocation that you would hold the entire time and that the rebalancing would happen on its own within the target date fund. And so you wouldn't then be shifting into something else later. You, you could definitely do that. It's a little bit more aggressive than the 90-10 because you've got this 20%. Uh, it's a bigger allocation to small cap value. One of the, thing, one of the things that's going to likely happen if you do that it is across your lifetime, if you're 27, you've got a lot of years before you're going to retire, almost 40 probably, unless you're fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're fired, that's awesome. If you're saving really well, then maybe it's 30 or 20. Um, but in 20 years, the small cap value will probably outgrow the target date fund, which means even though you're only putting 20% in, your allocation could grow to 30% or 40%. That's a good point. And, and as that happens, uh, your volatility is going to go up in the amount you have to tolerate in, in kind of ups and downs. The drawdowns are going to go up too. So uh, that's why I don't include... Actually, I do include in the appendix of the book an analysis of that strategy, but it's not one of my three teaching examples because it, it raises the risk as you're approach, approaching retirement quite a bit. The 90-10, the risk still comes down as you approach retirement. And you haven't been through it, but um, I went through it about five or six years ago. Retirement is a freaky time. It really doesn't matter how well you've saved, you know, how much you've saved. It, it's just this really freaky time because you're going from a regular paycheck and knowing where the money's coming from to it's coming from your investments. And I remember we'd been retired maybe three or four months and my wife looked at me and she said, where's the money coming from? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, you're like, let me get you a copy of two from, funds for life. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take some from the investments and all of the research says that's okay. You know, but, but it took a, probably a couple of years, two or three years before we all kind of just looked at each other and said, Oh, this is totally fine. You know? And so I think for a lot of, a lot of people, having something that lowers the risk in the years coming into retirement and the first few years of retirement is really important. And then uh, people who've oversaved are probably going to ramp back, ramp the risk back up. 
they're going to probably just get comfortable with it and go, oh, yeah, I don't need to have 10 years of bonds. You know, I can have five years of expenses in bonds because I'm really confident across the lifetime that, you know, these equities do well for me. Right. So it's it's kind of an interesting, tricky thing to navigate for every everybody's different. Yeah, yeah, definitely. My parents are retired. They are in their late 50s and um, they are living on pension income from my dad's old employer. And they basically took their, you know, holdings to some asset manager and said, we want 20,000 a year or 30,000 a year or whatever it is from this. And he was like, uh, yeah, that's not going to be, that's not going to be an issue, but they're so nervous right. about it because it's, a, it's yeah, you're basically charging down the road, saving as much as possible and then coming to a stop and throwing it in reverse. It's like, it's not going to feel natural. So I love that you said like, you know, it could take years for you to get used to the feeling that it's okay to, to actually draw down on things. Um, but it is a weird time to be an early retiree. So given the current market conditions and I guess I'd call it like the economic outlook we're seeing right now. There's a lot of doom and gloom in pretty much every headline about inflation and about the fact that we're now going to be entering a recession and everyone is so sure of that. So anyway, given what's happening right now, would you amend the two funds for life portfolio at all? Or do you think it still remains valid given those current circumstances? Is this just a period where we have to, you know, basically... A, realize that this is what markets do and we just have to hold or or would you make any changes i i i think it's more your uh, your words about just you know recognizing that every everybody always says it's different this time uh we've had the great thing about the work paul and i do is that since we're focused on buy and hold investors we're looking for things that are evergreen that have been uh, that have stood the test of time so the strategies that uh, that we're relying on, basically tilting a little bit towards small and a little bit towards value uh, across every 20 year period, every 40 year period for the last 90 plus years, uh, those have done well. Uh, so it, the worst case is usually that you tracked the market. The best case is that you beat the market by a lot. And uh, so I, I think that the strategies are evergreen. Um, just remember that the whole purpose of the media is to freak you out and keep your attention. There's always, as Paul likes to say, there's always the good news in column A and the bad news in column B. And you can choose to focus on whichever one you want. But uh, what we really hope buy and hold investors do is that they they pick a strategy that is well justified by historical by deep historical analysis. And then I, uh, you know, my six words of advice for investors, these are all Jack Bogles, but I, I love them are buy right, hold tight, don't peek. You know, those six words are genius. If you can do that, uh, you'll do very, very well. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for being here, Chris. I really appreciate your time. Oh, it's been a pleasure. This is fun. <laughs> Good. We'll have to have you back. That'd be great.